Welcome everyone, Costini here with a discussion about Ultimate General American Revolution Early Access. And in this video, I want to talk about early game, I want to talk about balance, I want to talk about design and about some of the dilemmas that currently exist for players in the game, specifically with regards to Boston, because there's quite a few issues over here. Now, I want to be very, very clear here that the developers did specifically state they had not really balanced the game right now going into this version of Early Access, because this is basically a beta for Early Access. So just be aware of that. The developers know that the game is not particularly well balanced. But even so, there's problems from both a historical standpoint and from a practical gameplay standpoint with the way the game starts and the way the early game is set up. So the early game is focused on the surroundings of Boston. Then Ticonderoga opens up, then Canada opens up. Now, the Siege of Boston did last quite a decent amount of time, during which Ticonderoga was taken, Benedict Arnold marched on Quebec, all of that did happen during this particular time period. But I think the game, from a practical standpoint, has a problem with that. There are 7,000 British troops over here in Boston in my campaign here by May. Now, this is pretty close to historical accuracy, but of course, starting the player against a significant number of enemy forces from the very beginning of a campaign. In fact, this, this is the most, this is the biggest army you will face as a player, even with the full campaign for well over a year. So essentially, the dynamic that exists in a campaign right now, as the game currently is, is you have this early game uh, situation and an inverted difficulty curve where the early game is the hardest portion of the campaign. If you can overcome it, you've basically won the campaign. If you can't, you're going to lose the campaign. That's simple enough to understand. Now, this is a problem because it basically means anyone that's starting the, the game, be it a new player who's never played the game in the series before or any of these games before, Jumping in is going to have a hell of a time on any difficulty. It doesn't matter if you reduce the enemy troops. If this is the largest army that a new player has to deal with for well over a year, and even then, like historically speaking, in New York, sure, there were a lot of British troops in New York, but if, if this is the largest contingent of enemy forces you have to deal with in a campaign, and you start having to fight these guys one way or another because sitting passively and wait and giving uh, ceding all the initiative on the campaign side of things to the British is a pretty poor idea. Also, there's other reasons. If you can eliminate this force, this means a lot of your other troops will be freed up to deal with other things like Ticonderoga, where the British in that area of Saratoga, Ticonderoga, have like 3,000 soldiers. So you're going to need to send it probably as much as many men as 3,000 or at the very least 2,000 in order to achieve that. I managed to take over Quebec with 2,000 total in that particular area, but certainly I was pushing things to the limit and I'm a pretty experienced player. I've played Gettysburg, I've played Civil War, I've played Age of Sail, I've played Total War for close to uh, two decades at this point. Like I've played the series since it cr got created and I've played Total War for a very long time and it was certainly harsh achieving this. Point is, having an uh, inverted difficulty curve is a problem from a gameplay standpoint. However, you then have the historical situation because yes, there were this many British troops in Boston. Of course, there were plenty of historical reasons why the British just sat in Boston. Because if they had moved out, and mind you, they did try Bunker Hill before the Alexington and Concord. When they tried to move out, they ended up suffering a significant number of casualties because the, the population in this particular area really disliked them. In particular, in Massachusetts, they despised the British, given um, everything that had led up to the siege of Boston. So... You have a deeply hostile uh, population that's heavily armed that did inflict significant casualties, historically speaking. People criticize Generals Gage, uh, Generals Gage and Howe for their conduct here. Honestly, I think Howe deserves a lot of criticism. His handling of everything, more or less, was pretty terrible. Gage, bit different situation, honestly. General Gage handled things, I think, in a more sensical way. Effectively, if the British had tried to move out of Boston, they would have gotten annihilated. Now, you can get them 
to move out of Boston is kind of ridiculous and against history, but you can certainly do it. How? Well, for instance here, the British will start with Providence, Newport, Marlborough, Boston, and uh, Salem. They do have a small force in Salem. So what you do is you go there, you send your general, you wipe that force out, and then you lower the British to uh, to counterattack. How do you do so? You start withdrawing your forces from the city. And when you do, and when you do, like so, you will start seeing them uh, you will start seeing them, you'll start getting a situation like this. This is how you win Boston. It's, you follow, you basically do this, you lure a portion of the enemy army to attack you. Over here, there's what, 1800 British troops, I've got 3000, I'll beat these guys. Once they're beaten and thrown back into Boston, then I'll just replenish my troops and attack Boston directly. And I want to do this quickly because the British will be reinforced. Seeding the initiative is a surefire way to lose. Mind you, I am not going to say that this is great or the way the game is balanced is fantastic. It is not. And I think that while I don't personally have, as a player, I don't necessarily have an easy solution to this. How do you maintain the historical accuracy of this period? while at the same time accounting for a fact this is a game. And in a game, you want to defeat our enemy as quickly as possible in every strategy game that's ever existed. Leaving the British in command of this particular area of Boston, like Boston is rich. Bo Boston would generate, like for instance, Mel Melborough, which the British start with, is generating 650 income. Boston itself would generate over a thousand and it has a significant population and it has a fairly substantial amount of loyalty towards uh, towards the Patriots. So ignoring Boston is just not really a great idea. Uh, like just ignoring uh, Boston and leaving it under British control is just not a great idea. Your campaign is going to be won or lost more or less at Boston and how you handle it. I do not feel it is a particularly great campaign dynamic to be absolutely clear on that subject. Because, quite frankly, it is a terrible campaign dynamic and means the hardest part is early on. And this is a complex, ga a complex game. There's a lot of moving parts to succeed in this. You need to understand the game systems. You need to understand the headquarters. You need to understand production and making guns. Because you're not going to have guns by default. Like, over here, for instance, I'm already starting... Pro uh, I'm running out of resources because I'm producing so many guns. So one of the things I'm actually going to do is maybe buy some more wood and iron though there's no iron on the market uh, which yeah that's kind of a problem <laughs> so suffice to say you push you basically push the player down a path of enormous early game aggression where their success or failure will depend on essentially cheesing the ai you can reduce the number of troops, you can change the balancing, but as long as you have this dynamic of so many troops and with the objective of capturing Boston, it's not going to be a great dynamic. Now, one of the reasons people struggle in this game is not just because of the sheer number of enemy troops, the lack of resources, in particular one of the problems we have is the lack of officers. You need regimental commanders and for... Uh, individual companies, you need company commanders. Now, if you're creating a militia regiment, you don't need officers to command the individual companies. Though what's annoying about this is you do need officers, for at least for re regular militia regiments, you don't need officers to command them, but you do need officers for skirmishers, for the Minutemen, and you, uh, you also need... Uh, you, you also need like officers, low-ranking officers, because you have uh, the regimental commanders, so those are regular officers, then you have low-ranking officers, you're going to need both. In fact, I think I spent in my campaign, because I finished this campaign, I conquered the entire territory and I'll load the safe to show you how exactly that looks. I finished this campaign, I think I spent a lot of reputation in the project just getting officers. And this was in a situation where I was building a lot of these schools um, over here. I was spending a lot of resources during the course of my campaign to build schools 
in order to increase my officer situation. Yeah, it's not great that regiment uh, militia regiments, if they their low ranking officers, their company commanders die, you have to spend your officer resource for that. I think maybe that should be changed. It would certainly improve things and would make militia worth using. I think militia should like there's always going to be a use for militia compared to the continentals. Now, of course, the problem here is uh, the problem in here is with the militia. The militia are just not good units, which goes completely against history, I should add, in every single way that counts. There's a lot of myths surrounding the American Revolution. One of those myths is that the militia were inexperienced and quite terrible. A bit of actual history, because I've been spending days researching this stuff. Actual history, the militia, yes, they were inexperienced as an army, because one of the problems the Americans had, the Patriots had during the Revolutionary War, is just discipline, supply, logistics, money. Those were issues. But in terms of actual fighting ability, the militia were decent enough at their job. They may not have had the same training as the British did, though keep in mind, the Patriots were still British during this time. They still had, they had the same kind of drill, training drill available to them. They knew it as the, uh, as the British regulars did. And they did train, in particular the men and men, compared to like the regular militia regiments. The men and men, which are your skirmishers over here in, uh, in the campaign, like your starting skirmishers, as the Patriots, uh, the men and men would have potentially trained weekly. Maybe. Obviously, there's a great discrepancy dependent on the militia types you're talking about, dependent on region. Some militia men were far more willing to fight beyond just their hometown. Some were far more willing to fight. Others, it was very difficult. But militias did fight. Like you had battle, uh, battles like Camden, uh, Camden, Cowpens, others, where you had militias from far away actually joining those battles from far away their own region. And they did quite well in, some, in many of the battles. In fact, in the vast majority of battles, uh, even before Valley Forge. There's also this myth like the discipline of the Continentals vastly improved after Valley Forge. It did, but there's this idea that the Continentals were not quite great before that. That is not quite true. That is not quite true at all. At all. Yes, they had issues, and there were a lot of screw-ups at New York, but I've looked over the major battles and even minor battles of the American Revolution War. Here's what I found. In the vast majority of battles that the British won, they outnumbered the Patriots. It didn't matter if they had militia. It didn't matter if they had the Continental Army. Typically, it was a combination of both. At Boston, they lost. And it was the vast majority of the army, the Patriot Army, that was assembled at Boston was made up of militia. Yes, there was there were disasters like Camden, there were disasters like New York, but those more more often than not were exceptions. And the problem for the British, of course, was moving into hostile land because they had a lot of own, their own logistical issues. Honestly, it's always easy to criticize a general that was more passive, but if the British had tried to move out of Boston to conquer territory around Boston early on in the war, all they would have gotten is annihilation, plain and simple. There were a lot of Patriot militias that were quite willing and capable of fighting. And for all of the discussion of Bunker Hill, because they're Bunker, Bunker Hill, right? More or less similar number of British regulars against Patriot militias. Yes, the Patriot militias were behind cover and a, and a strong defensive position. And the British did have a really bad strategy, but the British regulars did suffer significantly higher casualties uh, ca casualties than you would in this game. Basically, if the battle Bunker Hill took place in this game, and it doesn't, it doesn't exist over here, uh, the militia would have gotten annihilated. And this creates plenty of problems, because right now we only have the American campaign, so you end up having this frustration where you get about 3,000 troops for free from the game, so you start with about 1,000 or so, You'll get reinforcements, so you, you'll end up with 3,000, or close to 3,000. And the British start with 4,000. That's just starting units that will soon be reinforced to over 7,000. And this is on normal difficulty, easy, probably less so than that. But even so, the British will have the numbers advantage and the quality, uh, quality advantage against you. And you just flat out can't compete with them. Like, 
you don't have the resources you don't you may have the money but you literally don't have enough resources to build the muskets to get the officers it will it would take a significant amount of time to do what it took the patriots historically speaking significantly less to mobilize a bigger force than the british had in boston and put it under siege that's what historically happened Maybe just giving the Patriots, maybe just giving um, the player num numbers parity compared to the British would be a way around that. But then you still have the issue of like, how do you preserve the historical accuracy of Boston? Because there were reasons why the Patriots didn't launch a direct assault on Boston. They had their own issues. Uh, basically, like the British couldn't move out of Boston. The Patriots didn't want to move in in Boston because they were, well, rightly concerned they would suffer enormous casualties they probably would have won if they had if they had decided to launch a direct assault by the way washington wanted to people talked them down pros and cons of both approaches but from patriot perspective and made it work out quite well for them to not launch a direct full-on assault on boston although if they had ca uh, been able to defeat the british army in boston well, if they could have eliminated 8,000 troops early on in the war, maybe New York wouldn't have been as much of a disaster as it ended up being. Pros and cons with that. Uh, with that entire situation. Mean So, effectively, during the historic siege of Boston, Washington felt so confident in his position, he literally dispatched quite a decent number of men to Benedict Arnold for him to invade Quebec. That didn't go so well, too few troops, weather was pretty terrible, British resistance was higher than expected, etc., etc., but he was able to detach a portion of the army. And you're going to have to deal with that. Even if you take Boston, you're going to have to deal with that because of naval invasions. I was able to take Quebec with 2,000 men. So there's something broken from both a practical standpoint, balance standpoint, and no, reducing, just adding a difficulty modifier where, like, on lower difficulties or there's fewer troops you still will have a campaign dynamic that isn't particularly great where the most important decisions in the campaign will be won or lost based on the early game decisions. Everything you do after this point is completely irrelevant compared to that. Now, I'm not saying that anything you do after this point, uh, that is just a free ride. You will have battles to fight. I have fought thousands, tens of thousands of troops after Boston. That certainly was the case. I think, like, I won the Battle of Boston in the campaigns I've played. Uh, but I still ended up fighting like 45, killing 40,000 British troops after that, 40,000 British regulars and Canadians after that from my campaigns. But um, absolutely, Boston is the most critical point. And that's the problem from a campaign design perspective, though it clashes with historical accuracy. But the way they've decided to handle it makes it neither particularly great from a gameplay standpoint or a historically accuracy, or from the perspective of historical accuracy. And a lot of that has to do with the militias. Though the officer shortage is also a significant problem, because you may not need the officers for militia, but if the, to create a militia unit, but you do need officers to replenish them if they get wounded or killed in battles. That is frustrating. So much later on, November 9th, 1775, Boston is under my control, and not just Boston, oh no. We have conquered Quebec, and a good decent portion of Canada, or at least all of Canada that is available in the game at this point. Benedict Arnold is holding the line over here, Washington had to march to deal with a rebellion in Montreal. I have to say, from a long game perspective, what's kind of frustrating is it just feels so RNG, like you get a rebellion, it feels just RNG. I had an entire regiment of cavalry, <laughs> I have my, I had my cavalry at one point, a particular point, um, just basically turned traitor, an entire regiment of my best units. A lot of money spent in that. Yeah, that, that felt really frustrating. The RNG factor is a genuinely frustrating to tackle. Either way, the problem with um, the, the problem with that Americans have to deal with, well, it's kind of self-explanatory. This is a militia unit. It's one I created because it has four units. So it has three units of regular militia. It has a general. Uh, these guys have civilian muskets. Okay. It is 550 men. This is a starting regiment that I had starting this campaign 
Now these guys, they do have brown besses, but let me just give you an idea. These guys have a close combat power of 55.1 and a skirmish combat power of 53. My militia has less than half of that. They're not too bad from a skirmishing standpoint, but they're absolutely terrible from a melee standpoint. But this is a good situation in some ways because it's going to be pretty bad in other cases. The power disparity between militia and, and the continentals is absurd. And yes, I'm rebuilding my cavalry here after some of them turn traitors. Okay, let's talk, uh, let's talk about it. This is a militia regiment. Looking at the stats, let's consider the regular militia. I'm not necessarily going to go too much into the weeds. You can get artillery, you can get minutemen. Minutemen are your skirmishers, artillery is artillery. The stats on these things is terrible. The ar artillery on militiamen is just basically garbage tier. Like reload one, accuracy four, speed one. Like it is not worth giving these guys the cannon. They are that terrible. Meanwhile, let's consider, uh, let's consider if I make uh, a regular infantry regiment. Keep in mind, you do not start with the ability of producing continental troops. No, you have to unlock this. And it's about, what, 100 reputation? And it, you have other things that you need to unlock, including getting as many officers as possible. But let's say I make a regular infantry regiment. You can't just make as many artillery units as, as you want. But let's consider this. Civilian musket, civilian musket, more. And then we look at the artillery. They have a reload of 6, an accuracy of 9, a speed of 1. Reload 6. Accuracy 9. Same guns, just different units. Versus the militia regiment, which has <laughs> which has an which has a reload of one, accuracy of four. There is an enormous difference between these units, suffice to say. A very significant difference between these units. It effectively means militia are trash tier units. The only reason I've used militia so far into this campaign. One, making a lot of uh, continental troops would have been very difficult because they require more officers to to construct. But two, I didn't need them. Like, I genuinely didn't need them because all the battles, the crucial battles were early on. So effectively, you fight the garrison at Boston, then the British probably going to send 4,000, 2,000, 3,000, doesn't matter, 5,000 troops. But effectively, you're going to have several major battles early on in the campaign which by design, because you can't get Continentals early on, the officer shortage, the gun shortage, the monetary issues, so you're going to have to fight the militias. Fought those battles, so you fight about 11,000 troops early on in your campaign. This is where it gets absurd. If you defeat that, congrats, you basically won. If you don't, you've lost. That is essentially the dynamic that exists in a campaign. Everything else was significantly less important in my campaign. So everything else, far less important, far less crucial uh, to tackle. So that's why I didn't go with, uh, uh, that's why I didn't go with more Continentals. If the difficulty curve was different, however, I certainly would have been running around with Continentals because militias suck in every single way that counts. So let's consider the aspects here. Militia Regiment, regular militia unit, melee 1, firearms 1, reload 1, speed 2. Infantry Regiment, basic fusiliers, melee 4, firearms 5, reload 8. This is the problem. Yes, there are 30 more men in a militia regiment, so you gotta account for the extra manpower. But ultimately... Like, when you're looking at the, dis the, the disparity over here in terms of power, you have, like, and mind you, let's just say we go with civilian muscular, right? You have a situation here where the Fusiliers, the Continental Army, is at, in, in the worst case, four times better in terms of melee, five times better in terms of firearm, the firearm capability, and eight times better in terms of reload. That's the problem, militia. May have been worse, but if you got them to the battlefield and you had decent organization for them, they weren't so terrible compared to them. Give them brown besties with bayonets, they would hold their own against regulars. In fact, they did many times over. In fact, some crucial battles. You know that movie, The Patriot, that shit movie that's trying to replicate the American Revolution? Yeah, Tavington. 
Tarleton, uh, historically speaking, yeah, he got annihilated. Uh, his army got defeated by militia, effectively. Uh, many other battles that did take place. Camden is the exception, the major exception. And it wasn't necessarily one of the biggest battles in the war either. You look at battles like Saratoga. You look at those kind of battles of that particular nature. Or you look at many battles where the numbers were the numbers were about even between the British and militia. Yeah, the militia could hold their own. They could win. And they could win in direct fight. Forget what Mel Gibson was saying in the movie The Patriot, shoulder to shoulder against the regulars as if it's suicide. It wasn't suicide. The Americans did it. The militia did it. The Continentals did it. Yes, they had their issues. They had issues of command and control. There were a lot of there was a lot of politicking in the in uh, in the patriot ranks. There were a lot of disputes. There were a lot of problems. But if you could get an army on the field of equal numbers between the patrons and the British regulars, chances were the British regulars were the ones that were going to lose one way or another. Or even if they won, they would have lost so many men that there was a pyrrhic victory at best. Because, truth be told, the British had other things on their plate to deal with in this particular period of history. Especially once the French entered the war, then things got really nasty for them to, to tackle. It's a myth. Lots of myths. The British are sore losers and are pretty salty whenever they lose. And, you know, there's this saying that uh, history was written by the victors. In the case of the British, history was written by both the victors in the wars they won, also by the losers in the wars they lost, including this one. So there's this myth that the British army was somehow competent. It wasn't. Like, land-wise, naval-wise, yes, the Britain, R Britannia ruled the seas. Land-wise, the armies of Prussia, Austria, France, and even Russia would beg to differ about the competency of the British on land. And incidentally, that would be proven many times over during this particular time period. <laughs> I mean, when the British faced Napoleon, oh, Napoleon lost that Waterloo. Ignoring the specifics of, of Waterloo, I need to point out how difficult it was for the British to actually prevail there and also other issues that the British did face against Napoleon or Napoleon's marshals. And besides, like, the Peninsular War was a sideshow compared to the main events that were happening, regardless, uh, regardless of that particular situation. So it's a myth. Spread by British, spread by Americans. Like, the Americans obviously wanted to portray themselves in the most glorious possible way that they had defeated a massive empire that outclassed them in every way possible. And in a lot of ways, Britain did, ignoring the problems that came with supply, with sending and supplying an army across the ocean. There are tons of issues that Britain had. But it's that myth. There, were, there was a lot of propaganda during this time period, including from good old George Washington. That's the problem. Malish, effectively, what I'm saying, you shouldn't start the campaign with units that are utter rubbish. That is the equivalent, to give you one, a, a 41 power advantage, and never mind the numbers advantage that the British start with, but a power advantage, it's the equivalent of playing Total War Warhammer free as Bretonia, using Bretonian peasants and fighting nasty skulkers. Anyone who's played Warhammer Free knows that matchup is insane. The fact that this is the starting dynamic that we have in this campaign is just as insane as that. It should be changed. Now, militia shouldn't be as, be as good as Continentals. Absolutely. Do I have to point out, I've kind of been unable to train my units. It just bugs out. Like if I, if I start training them and I hesitate to unpause the game here because I've had crashes in this particular period. There's a naval invasion that's going to crash over here and bugged out and crash my game. Um, I can't continue this campaign because of that. But if you start seeing this, like not enough ammunition. Meanwhile, my ammunition situation. Yeah. I think I have enough ammunition in uh, Falmouth to support my troops. More than enough ammunition. Like it's saying, it, it's saying it would cost 26 ammunition a day, but that's global ammunition cost, not local. Certainly, there's enough local ammunition to supply all of these troops for training, but yeah, it's just not happening. So bugs, glitches, bad design. Now, 
one of the be- uh, now another thing to mention about these militia units and what makes them so bad. The stirring militia units are limited to three companies. The actual militia regiments have four. So if I start adding units over here, you can see it goes up to four. That is one of the problems. And yeah, by the way, at this point, yeah, I have a lot of officers. Um, but certainly, uh, it's like, I think I've spent more reputation on a global project that gives me uh, low ranking officers than anything else combined. Like, I haven't even been researching things properly here. I've been literally just dealing with officer shortage. Because when you have fight battles, and when you annihilate 60,000 British troops and Canadians, you tend to lose uh, quite a few officers. In fact, at this current rate of the campaign, I'm not quite sure there will be any Americans left on the continent by the end of it. So it is not a great dynamic, the number of casualties. We can talk about the morale situation as well, how battles are focused too much on killing as opposed to morale. Not many, not that many people necessarily die directly in combat. A lot of people died from disease. A lot of people were captured. Saratoga and Yorktown were so important because a significant portion of British troops were actually captured over there. Not because they were butchered by the the hordes of corn. So issues absolutely over there. Uh, bugs, glitches, uh, certain questionable things. I have plenty of ammunition to train my troops for quite a bit over here. And this is without ammunition production, like if, uh, without any significant ammunition production. If I want to produce a lot of ammunition, you can be certain I bloody well can at this point. That's the thing with these kind of games, with uh, these style of games. You really want to take a lot of territory as quickly as possible because you've got production to set up. You've got things to sort out. You've got, uh, you've got resources that you want to start producing and so on and so forth. And that is important. I do like some of the dynamics, though. Like, for instance, right now, I literally am out of food. Why am I out of food? Because winter is coming. I didn't necessarily invest too much in that, in the production of food. So, yeah, things are not looking up from that perspective. Um, might run out of food. Might not be able to supply all my forces. Pretty problematic from that point of view. Although, that just pushes you even more towards aggression because if you can win the campaign early on then you can avoid uh, fighting during the middle of winter which causes a lot of issues in your campaign uh, that you have to tackle i probably have a reasonable enough food to be able to survive relatively intact over here and besides every single one of the armies that you see here these free four <laughs> sorry four Four armies that you see here can deal with any invasion. The troops that I have here, yeah, it's kind of silly. You're, you might be wondering why I have troops outside of settlements here. Well, it's because this particular militia uh, regiment is keeping both these towns in check at the same time. Line aside. Anyway, militia needs to be buffed and a new campaign dynamic needs to be created for a game as opposed to uh, the Zerg rush towards Boston, as I would call it. Or the ping pong between settlement captured that we might have otherwise, because that's also not particularly great. The reason we want to take Boston is to free up forces, because if you don't have enough forces to conquer Canada as quickly as possible, you will start having Canadians invading your territory, which is not great once you start dealing with the thousands of people navally invading you. Needs to change, needs to be improved. Costine here, signing out. Stay tuned for more.